Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our last lecture in the History of Western Thought series, Why We Think the Way We Do. Good to see everybody this morning. And usually when it rains, everybody stays home. But uh, it's good, good that you came out during the dry interim. So um, in our lecture series, this is what we've been doing. Uh, well, first, I keep forgetting. I, I put this up here at the start and the end. If you've missed any of these lectures or if you want to refer somebody else to them, they are available online. Please feel free to go there, or if you, as I said, if you just need to see one of them again, then you can go to www.liteachapala.org, and under the eight-week lectures tab, you will find uh, several of the lectures that I have done previously. The previous one was World Religions, for instance, and then this one on History of Western Thought. So you can you can go there if you want, or refer other people there, because some people said they, you know, my daughter's studying philosophy, and I really want her to hear this, or whatever, so feel free to do that. This is where we've been going. Today, of course, is the last of our lectures, and we call it an eight-week lecture series, but because I have to be gone one week, we, it's only seven actual lectures. So today, we are going to solve all the problems of the world, because today, our lecture is where do we go from here? And I'm going to be briefly covering the big points that we've made already, and then introducing you to a concept that I have not talked about before, although it is, it is the summation of where our Western culture is today, uh, the, we are in the period of postmodernism. I'm going to explain what that means as best I can, although people disagree about what the definition of that is. Uh, and then we will talk about, well, what are we supposed to do with all of this? Especially since, most recently, the last philosophers we've looked at have been quite depressing, to be quite <laughs> honest about it. Uh, and that's kind of the nature of things. The pessimism, the nihilism, the meaninglessness, we'll talk about that. But first, the progression of philosophical thinking. I've talked about these things before. I've actually added a little bit of these definitions. But these are the characteristics of what the modern age in the West has dealt with. We have talked about, first of all, and this is based upon the earliest philosophers we talked about, uh, for the most part, especially from Descartes on, rationalism, that if rationality is the only way to know truth and reality. If something's not rationally explicable or can be explained by rationality, then it cannot be true or real which means it discards any of the things that are not cognitive or rational. You know, feelings, heart, again, I can give you a list. Love, honor, trust, loyalty, those are not cognitive, rational things, and yet rationalism would say that those things therefore are not real, and that they're therefore nothing that you cannot contain within your own thinking is, can be considered real. And scientism, scientism is similar to that, and it's uh, accepted it applies a methodology to it, if you will, that science and empirical observation are the only sources of truth, therefore anything not subject to scientific investigation cannot be real or true. This was, remember last week I talked about the logical positivists, this was their verification principle, that anything that you cannot scientifically demonstrate cannot be true or cannot be real. This is an extrapolation or an extension of the rationalism idea. Again, you'll notice that there is no room in the scientism idea for anything that is not physical, material, and rational. That love, you know, they make great efforts to try to say love is simply a chemical reaction that happens in the brain, or whatever, and yet they've not been able to get very far with that. This was kind of where a lot of this stuff started. Then we moved into almost a second phase of the, the, the considerations where we introduced even a stronger sense, this was Descartes as well, but others, subjectivism. Subjectivism means I, the subject. That it's all about me, it's what I think, what I experience, or what I prefer. If it seems true to me, then it is true. This is why people will say, well, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. My truth is dependent upon what I prefer. That there is no objective truth. It's all a subjective determination. Right? No objective truth. I think we're going to talk a little bit about some of the problems we run into. If there is no, no such thing as an objective truth, that there is only subjective truth, then what is the basis of morality? Just what I want it to be? If we believe that's true, if we absolutely buy into subjective reality, then Hitler had every right to do what he was doing, because for him that seemed like the right thing to do. Or Stalin, or you know, Pol Pot, or you name it. They based it on the fact there is nothing outside me that will determine what I should do. It's what I decided. We then have skepticism, skepticism which says nothing can be proven, so everything has to be doubted. How do you 
you know anything? How can you be sure of anything? And the great champion of this, of course, was David Hume. And therefore, you can't argue the, the absolute truth of anything to me, because how do you know? How can you be sure? How do you know is the ultimate discussion killer if you're talking about the nature of reality? And then relativism, the idea that no truth can be absolute, truth is entirely relative. Again, these things are interrelated. Relativism and subjectivism are very similar. No truth can be absolute, truth is entirely relative. It varies among different circumstances and different experiences. This is the basis of what in, in ethics you call situational ethics. Meaning there's no, there's no right and wrong other than what the situation calls for. The end justifies the means, which is related to the next one, which is pragmatism. Pragmatism is actually a philosophical system that was developed by Charles Sanders Peirce and a person we talked about, which is William James, which says if it works, it must be right and true. If it works for you, then it's true for you. If it doesn't work for you, it's not true for you. Which is why Gordon Gecko could say, Greed is good. Greed works in the movie Wall Street. Well, it works for him, so it must be good. It must be true. It must be right. The end always justifies the means is the, the mantra of situational ethics. Well, to get to where you want to be, or need to be, or think you need to be, doesn't matter how you get there. Anything justifies the end. Like, the, you know, the killing of six million Jews, for instance to achieve what they thought was the pragmatic end, the final solution. We often use the, the Nazi example because it's such an extreme one, extraordinary one. I mean, it is so gross and large as to be you know, undeniable, although there are deniers. And then humanism. Humanism says that truth is found in humans and science rather than revelation from any supernatural force. Therefore, there is no God, there is no supernatural, there is nothing beyond the physical world. We are the center of the universe. There is nothing beyond us, beyond humans. We are the highest order of anything. Well, strangely enough, humans, one of the things that leads us to is the idea that since there's nothing supernatural, there's nothing transcendent about us either. We are just animals. You know, Darwin said we are simply animals. We simply happen to be at the highest end of the order of animals. Freud said we are creatures that are driven by our sexual desires just like any other animals. Uh, Marx said we are simply units of production. All three of those things, in fact the three of those things taken together, have sufficiently dehumanized humanity that it's quite inconsistent but still true that humanism, and again there's a good kind of humanism, there's a kind of humanism that values human life, but this philosophical humanism says there is no truth outside me, outside us. There is nothing bigger than us. Well, the contradiction between that is that some of the philosophers that have led us to the point where we are today exactly said that human beings were simply a, one form of animal. And much of the evil that happened in the 20th century, that I just already mentioned several examples of, were because if human beings are not in any way transcendent, if we are not different than any other animals, then why not? Okay, if there is nothing transcendent, then why not? Dostoevsky said, if there is no God, then all things are permitted. And that's basically the same thing we're saying here. Now, there is a point here at which, and some of these things feed into it, but there's a point here at which a shift even beyond this uh, happened. This is the chart that I had used um, where we looked at idealism and materialism and various philosophers and how they influence one another and how they develop new ideas. The point being, why we think the way we do is because people came up with this stuff. So many people believe that what they think about their worldview, how they understand life and what's valuable and, and how we know truth, you know, what is good and what is true and what is right, is just naturally, inherently common sense. It's not according to the way the world thinks today. It actually, the various pieces of that were made up by these folks. The, the thing that I want to point out here with this chart again, and, and again, if you want to see these, all the PowerPoints are online too, so you can look at this again. If you draw a line somewhere right here, maybe just above Frederick Nietzsche, but certainly above Wittgenstein, the lies of positivists, and Jacques Derrida, deconstructionism, we made a move away from all of these things. The pieces of those were still there. But we added something. And we actually made a shift because up until the start of the 20th century, we were in the, the age called modernism. 
And so people argue about when it, when it changed. Generally speaking, I think it changed at the, that we left modernism at the end of the First World War, and certainly by the end of the Second World War. Modernism was characterized, and we'll talk about this in a minute, by this, this expectation of greatness. That human beings were getting better and better. That the world was getting better. That, that an increased um, standard of living. Just the, we were getting rid of the diseases. Everything was looking great. And then 1914 comes along, and a whole generation of European young men die in a, the most ridiculous, unjustifiable way possible, in the horror of the trenches. And that led to a development of a real pessimism that all of these things, you know, all, all of the stuff we're talking about here, like humanism, for instance, the, the, pro, the idea of progressive perfection of humanity, that human beings were the point of all that is good. Well, human beings had killed millions of people. There were battles in the First World War where over a million people died in one battle. And they died in horrible ways. They were still, many of, many of the armies of the First World War were still fighting using Napoleon, Napoleonic standards. You know, stand up and march forward. Only Napole in Napoleon's time, they didn't have machine guns. And they didn't have mustard gas. And it was a horrific thing. And Western Europe especially, and it then fed into the United States. We didn't suffer nearly as much. We came into the war, uh, the war very late. There was a pessimism. A lack of sense, a sense in which the whole modernist ideal that we can be, we are perfectible, that we're getting better and better, and that the human mind and the human experience is the ultimate arbiter of what is true and real and good. Pessimism began to take over, and even a, a sense of meaninglessness. And when we look at, we get a little bit Nietzsche bleeding over into this, even though he was before the First World War, but when you look at Wittgenstein and the logical positivists, and Jacques Derrida and, and the very modern, uh, the most recent kind of approach, we've changed from a modernist idea of progress to a postmodern idea of pessimism and meaninglessness and even nihilism. Nihilism literally, quite, uh, literally means hopelessness. It's the idea that nothing has meaning. All the things we put all our stock in have not worked out. We are not making progress. We are not getting better. In fact, there is no better. There is no progress. There is no meaning. It's just words. It's just language. That's why all of the most modern philosophy has been oriented around language. Starting with Wittgenstein, then the logical positivists and their scientism, and then with, with Derrida, that different people use certain words in the, in the, and mean different things by them. As Derrida pointed out, like a priest says truth, and that means one thing. It means something different than what truth means to a scientist, or to a policeman, or to a journalist. And because of that, starting with Wittgenstein and his language game, the idea that language is the whole point, and then later Derrida, they said, since people use words in different ways, it's just a language game, and nothing means an absolute anything. In fact, there is no absolute anything. There is no absolute we can refer to. There is no transcendent meaning. There is no meaning at all. It's all just words. And the result of that has been nihilism. Nothing has any meaning. Strength is all that matters if you can take control and rule. Do we not see that in the 20th century? Pessimism and hopelessness reigns. And it's because God is dead. The transcendent is dead. There is no transcendent meaning. Modernism, which, as I say, through the 19th century up until probably the First World War, some people say that the seeds were planted in Europe in the First World War, and then they spread to the globe at the end of the Second World War. Because it, it was only 30 years after the horror of the First World War that we did it all over again in World War II. And the United States felt that one much more because we came in earlier in that and we had a lot more fatalities in that. So modernism had said, humanity is the measure of all things. It's our reason, our experience, our will that creates reality. We don't need a transcendent God or a transcendent anything. We are the center of all the universe and meaning. They said that humanity is perfectible and we're constantly progressing. We're getting better and better. This is up till the First World War. That rationality, science, and technology are our gods. You know, we can do anything with technology. 
In the early 1900s, they were saying, you know, by the year 2000, we're all going to be, we have jet packs, and there'll be no more hunger, no more disease, no more war, no more problems. We'll have solved everything. That's what modernism thought. They also thought that the primary human function is to satisfy our appetites. This is what led us eventually into a lot of the, the liberalism that we had in terms of sexuality and that sort of thing. And that power and the achievement of power are good. All of the early industrial megagiants, all of the Carnegies and, the, and those kind of folks came out of this thinking that getting rich, having a higher standard of living is the most important thing. But the part of what happened, and this especially happened as we moved into postmodernism, is if nothing has meaning and nothing really, there are no real values anymore, then how do you measure stuff? Have you noticed that today when they talk about a Monet painting being sold or whatever, What's the headline say? Dollars. Dollars. We have lost our ability to measure anything except for how much it's worth. We talk about a novel and we talk about the fact that it's on the New York Times bestseller list. Not that it's innovative, it's creative, it is a new approach to a certain genre. We don't have any value statements about anything anymore except what it's worth, how many it's sold. Have you noticed that? It's because we have destroyed all the other values. Nothing else has any meaning, but we still know we still have to have money. And so everything is defined in terms of its money. That started with modernism and the rise of all of the steel magnets and railroad tycoons and all that kind of stuff, and has carried over to modern times. The idea that truth, goodness, and reality are entirely subjective and relative. There are no absolutes. There's no thing that's absolutely true or absolutely false. My mind decides what is true and real. My reason. My motivations decide what is good. I want it. And I have the will to make it happen, to get what I want. So it's will based upon the experience of what I desire. This idea that that was what modernism was about. We're progressing and we began to have values that did not refer to any transcendent anything because modernism was about the natural of the world, the, the things that can happen in, in, for humans in this world. The difficulty was, after experience all this, and this is where scientism, the idea that science is going to bring us all of this miraculous knowledge and miraculous cures, the idea that, um, that we could control creation, that human beings were in charge, and we could do whatever we wanted, and that there was an increased standard of living that was possible so that everybody on the planet would have everything they really wanted eventually. That was what modernism was about. The problem is that with the First World War, and certainly by the end of the Second World War, Without being even aware of it, Western culture looked at modernism and said, the report is in and you failed. And they had nowhere else to go. Human beings are not getting better. We're getting worse. We are increasing, our, tech, our increase in technology is increasing the way we can be viciously cruel to one another. That we can torment and kill in much more efficient and expansive ways. And so we entered into postmodernism, whereas this is what modernism will be. This is from the previous slide. We get into postmodernism, and Western culture says the modernist principles have not proved satisfying in any way. We simply have not been able to really accomplish it. People aren't getting better. Everyone doesn't have a decent standard of living. Diseases are still killing people. In fact, some of the diseases we thought we got rid of are coming back. And faced with the knowledge of my true self, again, modernism said, it's, you know, I'm the highest form. I can do anything. And yet, if I'm honest about who I am and what my, mo what my appetites are, what my motivations are, and yet I'm told there is no place outside myself that I can turn, I have nothing left but meaninglessness and despair. Modernism took away anything outside and then failed to prove that we could be better as human beings. And so postmodernism says, if I'm all I've got, there's nothing outside of me, then I am really in trouble. And pessimism, despair, nihilism, meaninglessness, philosophy actually embraced meaninglessness. Karl Rashke, uh, one of the followers of Jacques Derrida, said deconstruction is the dance of joy on the grave of God, and we should just do that's where our society is. And you know what? It affects you 
whether you realize it or not. Everyone who is living today is living in a postmodern culture. We are affected by these things. And when you say, well, but really? I don't believe those things. Look at the news. The racial violence and tensions, the high rate of suicide, the increase in alcoholism and drug addiction, despite all the efforts to try to stem those things, the international conflicts that occur and continue to occur and get worse and worse, the fact that we're looking at a very strong possibility of going back into another Cold War, and on and on and on. Are we not in a very messed up state as a culture? Even, even, and we are all affected by that. We are all affected by those things that we see in the news, whether we realize it or not. And they are all a reflection of the pessimism, the lack of a sense that we can really do better, that modernism had. Postmodernism says, we're just in trouble and there's nothing you can do about it. <coughs> there are three main elements that we would identify as part of postmodernism. One is an anti-foundational concept of subject and identity. Foundationalism is the belief that there are certain theories of knowledge that make sense, that are based upon justified belief. In fact, justified real belief is one of the definitions of truth in philosophy. But anti-foundationalism, which is a characteristic of, of postmodernism, says there are no certainty of conclusions based upon any, any practical premises. You can't be sure. There is no logical connection between things. Some of that we go all the way back to, to Hume, David Hume for. That you can't be sure because anything has happened a certain way in the past is going to happen in the future. So postmodernism says, you don't know. There's no way you can know what's going to happen. There is no foundational connection of things. It also says, secondly, that history as we understand it is dead. A true postmodern philosophy would say it's no longer possible to do history. You can recollect things that have happened in the past, but the sense that there is a flow of time that makes sense, they deny that. They deny any idea of progress, which was the, the major theme of modernism. It's not postmodernism. There is no progress. We're worse off now than we were then. There is no teleology, which means the end result that we're all working for. Tele teleology means the thing that we are all progressing toward. There is no teleology. There is no end result. There is no expectation for this turning out all right. And finally, there's the death of metaphysics, defined as the search for objective truth. There is no meaning. There is no truth. There is no objective anything. And that's where we find ourselves today. Um, they talk about postmodernism as being a new kind of superficiality or deathlessness, um, in which the models that uh, previously had explained people and things in terms of inside and outside, I have internal desires and an outside, those are all blown up. Nobody talks that way anymore in terms of academics or philosophy. A uh, quote that I want to give you here from J.P. Moreland, which sort of a, it gives us an explanation of postmodernism. Postmodernism is post because it denies the existence of any ultimate principles, and it lacks the optimism of there being a scientific, philosophical, or religious truth that will explain everything for everybody, a characteristic of the so-called modern mind. That's what modernism said. It's not postmodernism. A characteristic of the so-called modern mind, the paradox of the postmodern position is that it placed in all principles under the scrutiny of its skepticism, it must realize that even its own principles are not beyond questioning. So even postmodernism is self-defeating. One more thing that we, you know, we end up running into a brick wall about. He continues, faced with such opposition and the pressure it brings, postmodernism is a form of intellectual pacifism that at the end of the day recommends backgammon while the barbarians are at the gate. It is the easy, cowardly way out that removes the pressure to engage alternate conceptual schemes, to be different, to risk ridicule, to take a stand outside the gate. You might as well not try, because you're not going to win. My brother used to say, well, if you can't make the team, don't go out. That's a postmodern saying in the sense that you're not going to win, so don't fight. The pacifist, but the pacifist way out is simply not an option. However comforting it may be, postmodernism is the cure that kills the patient. The military strategy that concedes defeat before the first shot is fired, the ideology that undermines its own claim to allegiance. And it is an immoral coward's way out that is not worthy of a movement born out of the martyr's blood. I don't think I added that last part, but he, he basically said there are people who gave their lives to create a sense of truth. 
know, our lives in the world. And we simply deny all of that. Are you feeling any better? <laughs> you alright? Okay, so from pessimism, the denial of objective truth, they also dispose of what's called meta narratives. Meta narratives are like a worldview. It's a sense that there is some overarching truth to which we are all linked. Uh, someone who is a Christian would say the Christian faith in the Bible are their meta narratives. But someone who is of a, you know, a different inclination would have a different kind of meta narrative. But postmodernism destroys all American meta narratives. So what are we supposed to do about this? Given the fact that this is the way our culture is going, and you can see the evidence of it on the news every day, every time a celebrity commits suicide or overdoses on drugs, and that's not like that never happened before, but it happens a lot more now. And frequently that is the result of the despair that comes. You know, you, you measure everything by the amount of money anymore because there are no other values that people really rely on. Artists and celebrities don't, don't really evaluate themselves, or they're not evaluated, on the quality of their work. Whether their artistry is, is contributing something valuable to the common experience of human culture. All the articles are, what are the ten highest paid actors in Hollywood? What's the best selling book? Well, once somebody achieves those levels of, of celebrity, if you will, and they discover that they are still <coughs> hopeless, and they're meaningless and pessimistic, we see it over and over again. Either that or overdose kinds of stuff. And I'm not being, I'm not trying to be overly dramatic, and I'm not trying to overstate that. I re there really is an increase in that kind of direction in our culture and in what we see happening in society, our inability to relate to one another. So what do we do? I got ten points I want to give you as to what we do about this. The first part of our response, you all are already doing something about this, and that is to be aware, to, to realize, to be aware of what our culture is thinking and saying, and from, from where people are getting these ideas. Most people experience all of this that I'm talking about today, the whole postmodern nihilism, and don't even know it. They have no idea where these ideas came from. They, have no re they don't recognize that there is a philosophy behind these things. When people watch the movie, Wall Street, and Gordon Gekko says, greed is good, greed works, they don't realize that's an expression of a specific philosophy that has more to do than just the, the stock market. Being aware means paying attention and realizing that all of this stuff we see happening is reflective of something deeper, is reflective of a philosophical kind of underpinning, a psyche, if you will, of our Western culture and how that is being affected by modern philosophy. By the way, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have a little bit more positive things to say toward the end, too. <laughs> Not just what you can do about it, but I'll give you a different picture. So that's one, is be aware. Pay attention. And when you hear something like that, think about where that's coming from. Secondly, think about the terrible consequences of accepting that there is no meaning and nothing beyond ourselves. And when I say think about the terrible consequences, I don't mean everybody go home and blow your brains out. I mean realize that that is the, what happens when we believe that there is nothing, there is no meaning. Somebody told me last week or the week before about a seminar that you had taken, and the seminar started out by, by the, the person leading the seminar saying, okay, there is no meaning in life. And so you just have to create something and identify your meaning in that. Is that correct? Right. The assumption there is no meaning in life. That's a brand new idea. Last 50 years or so. Do we have to buy that? Just because it's the latest idea doesn't mean it's the right idea or the best idea. So realize the consequences of there being no meaning and nothing about ourselves is <laughs> horrifically damaging. Human beings need something more than that. We, we demand something more than that. We demand some kind of meaning. There's a Paul Simon song in which he says um, that he's talking about a woman and she says that a, a good day ain't got no pain. A bad day is when I lie in bed and think of things that might have been. That's postmodernism. The meaninglessness of it. It should have been different and it's not, so I'm just going to stay in bed. That's the consequence of not believing there is some meaning. 
and believing that our job is to find it. Okay, that's your, that's your task, is to go out and find meaning. We'll talk about that a little bit more too. Recognize that when something doesn't make sense or doesn't work, say so. When you hear Gordon Gekko in a movie say, greed is good, greed works, go, holy moly, the downside of that is so much more horrible than the upside. It's good for you, because you get to buy another jet. But what about all the people that, that are suffering because of that? Where's the moral standard? You need to be willing to, even if it's just to yourself, say that something doesn't make sense or something doesn't work. Last night I was reading through some more deconstructionist, postmodern philosophy stuff. And, I, and Carolyn was sitting there reading something I read this. I went, holy moly, I've studied this stuff a lot and I still am astonished at the crap these people write and expect us to believe. Um, I, I didn't even bring some of the quotes, but I read one to her, and I said, you know, part of what we need to do, excuse, I'm about to use a bad word, but forgive me for it, bad word by a minister in the church. There are times when we need to prepare, be prepared to hear this stuff or read this stuff and call on the yeah. There's no better way to express it than that. That sometimes you just have to say, that's just stupid. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't work. It doesn't fit the human experience. So forget it. Stick it in your ear. I'm not going to buy that. Okay? Um, Clarence Darrow was once asked by somebody why he always got so many contempt of court violations for cursing in court. You know, Clarence Darrow, the great attorney, and he said, well, young man, it's because there are so damn few words everybody understands. <laughs> so sometimes the profanity can convey a meaning that's important. Okay. Number four, reclaim your own foundation. Reclaim your own meta narrative, if you will, the thing from which you draw your meaning. Some things are true and some things are not true. I'm going to give you a quote by Harold Pinter in a few minutes that is an example of how ridiculous the things are. Some things are right and other things are not right. Some things are good and other things are not good. And we have to be able to call that. To say everything is equally true is a violation of one of the basic laws of thought. The law of non-contradiction. Something cannot be both true and not true in the same way at the same time. It is not rationally possible. And yet people say, it could be true for you, but it's not true for me. Some things are true and some things are false. Some things are good and some things are bad. And what you like and don't like doesn't change that. And we need to reclaim that as our meta narrative or foundation. We may not always agree on the degree of good, but we know that eating children is a bad idea. I don't care if there were primitive cultures in ancient times who ate children. It's still not good. Taking advantage of weaker people for your own gain is wrong. It doesn't matter that you have the power to do it or the will to do it. It doesn't matter that you conceive of yourself as one of the ubermensch, the supermen. doesn't matter that your morality allows you to do that. You're either a terrible person and need to straighten up or else you're a sociopath. It's not just a difference in values. Okay? We need to call that. And one of the reasons is because, and I quote um, philosopher Phillips here, who says, Our society dogmatically rejects truth in theory, but cannot live that way in practice. When I say if something doesn't make sense or doesn't work, you should say so, and know that some things are and some things aren't, the philosophers may say that, but you can't live like that. Like Crocodile Dundee, you know, when he's pulling up roots and berries and giving it to the woman, and she says, you can eat this stuff? He says, oh yeah, you can live on it, but it tastes like crap. Right? There are certain things that we can say, well yeah, you can say that, but it doesn't work. It doesn't feed you. It doesn't give you what you need to be a real human being. And Phillips goes on, postmodernity has nothing to believe, including its own unbelief, despite the aching need of humans to know and believe. You need to pay attention to what there is something in you that has a desire. There's a whole uh, line of philosophy called Reform uh, Reformation Epistemology that looks at the existence of God as being a given based upon the fact that every culture that has ever existed in all of history has had some belief in God or the supernatural or the transcendent. 
without exception. We've never found any culture that did not have a belief in the supernatural in some form or another. And the fact that human beings, all the research today is indicating that human beings are hardwired to believe in the transcendent. A lot of research is going on right now. And so there are philosophers, Alvin Plantinga is one, Alistair McGrath is another, um, who are now proposing that our perception of the transcendent of God is actually a given sense, just like it's built in, just like sight and hearing and taste and touch that our ability to perceive the transcendent and to require the perception of the transcendent doesn't require justification because it's an inherent sense just like the other senses that we have. So we need to be prepared to say that no matter how the philosophers tell us, there is an inherent need in human beings to believe in the transcendent. And as a Christian minister, I can tell you what I think that ought to be, but that's not the nature of these lectures. And in terms of people who say there, you know, there is no absolute truth, there is no right and wrong, it's all subjective, I'll give you a quote from D.A. Carson. He says this, one professor made this point after his college class had united against him in insisting that nothing is ultimately true or morally wrong in an objective sense. In other words, the students were arguing nothing is absolute, nothing is ultimately true or false, nothing is morally right or wrong. It's all entirely subjective. What I think is wrong. The next day, the professor informed the students that regardless of their performance on the exam, they were all going to receive an F. The students objected in unison, but that's wrong. And the professor's point against relativism was made. No one can live it, and therefore no one really believes it. If you get an F no matter what you do, somebody who says that there is no right or wrong would not disagree with that. There's no right or wrong. There's no, you can't say, but that's wrong if you don't believe in right or wrong. We all do, in fact, the, the moral argument that, that we all have a sense. When we say that human beings are just animals and we're nothing more than that, when an animal kills another animal, we never accuse it of murder. When a dog copulates with another dog in the street, we never, we never claim that it's right. We have a completely different moral set of standards for human beings than we do any other creature and I believe that that's an evidence that we, we believe that human beings are inherently transcendent in some way over all other life forms. And yet, modern science would tell us that ultimately we are simply at the high end of the animal chain and nothing more than that. It doesn't work. There's actually is a whole moral argument for the existence of God. Now, this idea of reclaiming the foundation, I'm going to give you a cartoon here. You probably won't be able to read that, I'll read it to you. It's a big guy with a small guy under his foot. He says, ouch, you're standing on my neck. And the big guy says, well, that's one point of view, but one could also say that you're trying to trick me with your neck. And he continues, you see, in the postmodern condition, we create our own reality based upon our internalized preconceptions. Since there is no longer one objective truth, we are free to create our own truth. So you see, there is no right and wrong, just an infinite number of equally valid stories. And the guy on the bottom says, but you're still standing on my neck. And the big guy says, you never went to college, did you? <laughs> really? We don't believe that there's right and wrong? We don't believe that there's good and bad? It's all just your story? And this is the quote I was talking about. This is Harold Pinker, who says, there is no hard distinction between what is real and what is unreal, or between what is true and what is false. A thing is not necessarily either true and false. It can be both true and false. No. No. The, the law of non-contradiction, one of the basic rules of rational thought. Something cannot be both true and not true at the same time and in the same way. And if you say, well, something can be partially true, well, that simply means you can divide it into two parts, one of which is true and one of which is not doesn't mean that it's both true and false at the same time. Harold Pinter is wrong. He was a postmodern existentialist playwright. So this is where this takes us. And I'll give you another quote here. This is Alistair McGrath, uh, a Christian philosopher and thinker. He says, to the postmodern suggestion that something can be true for me but not true, 
The following reply might be made. Is fascism as equally true as democratic libertarianism? Consider the person who believes passionately and sincerely that it is an excellent place, uh, an excellent thing to place millions of Jews in gas chambers. That is certainly true for him. But can it be allowed to pass unchallenged? Is it as equally true as the belief that one ought to live in peace and tolerance with one's neighbors, including Jews? If we accept the postmodern idea that truth is relative to the person, then we have no reason to, to accuse the people who committed the atrocities of 9-11 of committing the atrocities. They were just doing what they thought was right. Really? You ready to go there? Or do we need to not sometimes say, ah, not partly. Some things are good and some things are bad. Some things are true and some things are false. Some things are right and some things are wrong. Decide for yourself, I'm going to continue with the rest of these ten things. Decide for yourself if science is the only source of truth, which is what much of uh, is still being said. Really? Do you really think science is the only source of truth? How does that relate to relationship, to love, to loyalty, to honor, to you know, familial affection, to respect for other people? Those are not scientifically, empirically an analyzable things. There is much more than what science can teach us. I love science. I started to go into the sciences until I realized that there were a lot of other courses in college I wanted to take and it couldn't fit them all in, so I did a degree in communications instead. But science is not the only source of truth. It is one source of truth, and it needs to be balanced. We need to decide for ourselves what we think about that. We also need to decide for ourselves if there is a God, really. Is there a transcendent being? Is there a transcendence at all? That is perhaps the most fundamental thing you need to decide for yourself. If you'd like to talk about that, I'd be happy to discuss it with you. Number six, and I don't have these broken up, so I'll just have to do one at a time, sorry. We need to choose hope and not hopelessness. We need to choose meaning and not meaninglessness. We need to not allow ourselves to give in to fear. This sort of petrifying, paralyzing kind of fear that so much of our culture now, is, now lives in. Number seven, we need to speak out for the need to regain a belief in objective reality, objective meaning, and objective transcendence. It's not just what I think. And I'm going to address humility here at the end. One of the reasons we got into this mess is because the unbelievable hubris of humanity. The pride that it's all about us, that we can figure it all out, that we can get ourselves all that. And then when we, figured, we finally had to admit we couldn't, we got depressed about it as a culture. Nihilism. Hopelessness. We need to say, no, there are objective truths, realities, meaning, transcendence. We also need to be intentional but gentle in not giving in to the negative attitudes and activities that mark postmodernism. And those things are rampant materialism. Remember, postmodern times, money is the only thing you can measure it by. There's no values anymore. Money you can count. Okay? Rampant materialism and consumerism, cynicism, nihilism, isolation and depersonalization, and the blind worship of science and technology. To do that, we need to be willing not to be seen as cool. See, I think that's a lot of it, is the culture and um, I'm going to give a quote by Ravi Zacharias in a minute, that much of this simply represents a mood. And the mood is, this stuff's cool. You know, Andy Warhol was cool. Painting of a Campbell soup can. Okay, I think that was interesting and a kind of cool, but it's fair to say, if that's art, what's the definition of art? Okay? Um, Jackson Pollock splashing paint on a canvas. I find some of that stuff very interesting. You know, I'm not completely against modern or postmodern art, but what does that mean about our perception of art? And does that disqualify the Impressionists or, you know, the Rubens and, you know, and Rembrandt and all of the great classicists? Does that disqualify them as art? Or are we willing to think in larger categories? We need to think about this stuff and not just go with what's cool. Better to be uncool in somebody's eyes and be truthful about 
what it means to be human than the other way. We need to reclaim and encourage the authentic. And here's the positive. When I say family, friends, conversation, worship, working with your hands, making things, there actually is right now, in just the last few years, a rebellion against postmodernism happening in our culture. There is a return to traditional values. You can see it in advertising. Advertising that is calling us back to the traditions of making really good bourbon. Jack Daniels has done this, for instance. And it's actually not bourbon. Bourbon has to come from Kentucky. It's traditional civic whiskey from Tennessee. But the idea that there is value in looking at historic traditions and how things have been done down through the generations. We are reclaiming some of that in advertising. We are reclaiming some of that in terms of valuing the work that people do with their hands, craftsmanship. There was a, a recent major magazine, and they had a series on modern makers. And what they meant was whether people were working with wood or uh, textile arts or uh, metal or whatever, they were honoring people who are able, with their own hands and their own creativity, their own ingenuity, to create something of value. The very fact that they're talking about that now is a sign of recovery from the pessimism, the non-value attitude of postmodernism. There is a return to an emphasis on family and on friendship and on conversations. Unfortunately, it's still all too common, and this is a very postmodern thing, to walk into a restaurant, sit down at breakfast and see a man and a woman and two kids. The man is reading a newspaper, the woman's reading a magazine, and the two kids are on their phones. Right? You seen it? Some people define postmodernism as the digital age. And all that goes with that as the digital addictions that we have are representative of the value change. That rather than sit and talk to a family member or a friend, we'll both be texting with somebody else that we can't even see and maybe that we don't even know. The Facebook world. But again, I'm not, I'm not saying those things are all horrible. I'm just saying let's be realistic about what those things are doing to us. But we reclaim family, we reclaim friends, and conversation, worship, a recognition of the transcendent and our relationship with the transcendent, working with our hands, making things, being real, producing value. Today, most of, of the commercial world is not in the producing of anything other than the, the creation and dissemination of information. That's what the primary world, you know, money is bits, is bits of data going back and forth. There's no gold, in, you know, in Fort Knox that's the basis of anything anymore. It's simply, it's all digitized. Well, to make something with your hands and say, I did that, is a regaining of a sense of value of what makes us human, quite simply. Because part of the definition of human is that we are beings that create. We make stuff. And when we stop making anything, we've lost part of our humanity. So you can regain some of that authenticity. And you need to think about that and work toward that. For instance, stop getting sales catalogs. I've been telling people this for years. All that happens when you pick up a sales catalog and you flip through is you are feeding your commercialism and materialism, that part of you that has been, that has been addicted to that and you're just making it worse. When you see stuff that, oh man, I need to get that. You don't need to get that, you want to get that. There's a difference. Don't read beauty magazines. Because as, as the old the Desiderata, that, that popular speaking song from many, many years ago said, if you look at beauty magazines, it, all it does is make you feel ugly. Right? That's not real. We need to regain authenticity. And finally, in my 10 points, is have some humility. We are not the end all and be all of everything. We are a piece of the puzzle. And in my belief, we are a loved piece of the puzzle. And we need to recognize that. Do everything we can, you know, make things, know that we're valued, but we need to have some humility about that. That we are not the arbiter of all that is true. I read Hume or Descartes or Kant or Hegel, some of my heroes. They thought they were going to solve all the problems of the world because they were that smart. And they were really smart, but they weren't that smart. 
None of us is that smart. None of us is capable of being that much. And we need to have some humility. And we need to have, we need to look for humility in others. We need to teach it to our kids. It may not be true for any of you all, but maybe you teach it to your grandkids. The idea that our children are the most important thing in the whole world is not true. They may be the most beloved thing in our lives, but they are not the most valuable thing on the planet. When we teach them they are, then they grow up with expectations that are not realistic, certainly with a lack of humility. My wife's mother used to tell her kids, you can have anything you want, but you can't have everything you want. That's probably the right balance. So these are my 10 recommendations. And to say them again, be aware of what our culture is thinking and saying and where it's coming from. Think about the consequences of, of actually accepting that there's no meaning and nothing beyond ourselves. Recognize when something doesn't make sense or doesn't work and be willing to say so. Four, reclaim your foundation, your own merit meta narrative. From where do you draw your value? What is it bigger than you that you can relate to? Your worldview. Fifth, decide for yourself if you really think that science is the only source of reality, because if you really think about it, I don't think you believe that. And really think about whether you believe there is a God or there is not a God, because that's the ultimate transcendence. Sixth, choose hope and not hopelessness. Choose meaning and not meaninglessness. Do not allow yourself to give in to fear or nihilism, the, the, this hopelessness or pessimism. Get yourself out of bed and go out and look for something to do. Look for meaning in your life, if nothing else. Seven, speak out for the need to regain a belief in objective reality, objective meaning, and transcendence. Be intentional but gentle in not giving in to negative attitudes and activities that mark our postmodern culture. Be willing to be seen as not cool, if that means rejecting what much of the modern world is suggesting of the postmodern world. Nine, reclaim and encourage the authentic. Family, friends, conversation, worship, working with your hands, making things, creating value, and believing in value. And then finally, have some humility and look forward in others. Ultimately, I think we need to look at the psyche of the Western culture as it is today, the postmodern psyche. We talked about how we built up to that as a mood, because it gives us, I think, the right perspective on it. And I give you a quote here from Ravi Zacharias, um, who is a Christian writer, but his, his wisdom in this, I think, is unquestionable no matter where you're coming from. Zechariah says, We are living in a time when sensitivities are at the surface, often vented with cutting words. Philosophically, you can believe anything so long as you do not claim it to be a better way. Right? Oh, I can't say that my way is better. And I'll, I'll stop there and give you an example. I was teaching a class on... Um, well, it's called False Religions at a church in Seattle. And it had to do with pseudo-Christian religions, particularly Scientology, Christian Science, and some others. And I believe absolutely that everyone has a right to believe as they wish and to worship as they wish, as, they, as long as they don't try to force it on somebody else. I absolutely believe that, and so I was not suggesting anything but that. But I was talking about why their beliefs were inconsistent with Christian beliefs. Well, a woman came up to me afterwards and she said, you know, I think it'd be really good if you would invite the representatives of these other groups to come in and tell us about what they believe. And I said, well, I have a concern about that for two reasons. One, I am here as an elder and by permission of the Presbyterian Church, it's a little awkward for me to invite people in to present something that's contrary to what my sponsors, if you will, the church that I'm part of, uh, maintains or believes or presents. I said, that's one. But the biggest reason is I don't think it's fair to invite somebody in to say what, what they believe in their particular religion. Um, when the purpose of my class is to explain why we believe with all respect that they're wrong. And, and she blanched and she said, well, you can't say they're wrong. And I said, actually, I can. They may be very, I'm sure they're very well intentioned and they have a right to believe what they want. But that's not the same thing as saying they're right in what they believe. I don't have to agree with them. In fact, I can't agree with everybody. Everything, everybody can't be right. Something can't be both true and false in the same way at the same time. A basic principle of rational thought. And if I say that I believe Jesus was the Son of God who came to earth, died, was resurrected, and is coming again, and somebody said he wasn't, we both have a right to believe that, but we can't both be right. She said, you can't say that they're wrong. I said, actually, I can. She said, well, certainly the ministers in this church wouldn't say they're wrong. The church I went to had 10 
ordained ministers and a lot of other staff. It's one of the biggest churches in America. And I said, actually, I went to seminary of four of them, and I know all the others, and they would absolutely agree with what I just said. They would say that those folks, God bless them, they have a right to believe what they want, but we don't believe they're correct in their beliefs. That reflects a kind of muddle-headedness where we have confused, we have taken political correctness to the point of being irrational and said, everybody has to be acknowledged as being equally right. Everybody can't be equally right. They have a right to believe what they want, and I would fight for that. Even if it's somebody believing something I disagree with, but I, that doesn't mean I have to say I think they're right. That's not that's nonsensical. And that's what Zacharias is saying here. Philosophically, you can believe anything so long as you do not claim it to be a better way. And so he was saying, I believe there is a better way. Religiously, you can hold to anything so long as it does not bring Jesus Christ into it. If a spiritual idea is Eastern, it is granted critical immunity. If Western, it is thoroughly criticized. Thus, a journalist can walk into a church and mock its carryings on, but he or she dare not do the same if the ceremony is from Eastern fold. Such is the mood at the end of the 20th century, the postmodern age. A mood can be a dangerous state of mind because it can crush reason under the weight of feeling. And that is precisely what I believe postmodernism best represents a mood. Now, I end with that because I think that gives a clarity. That what we're dealing with here is not an exposition of great truths, so much as it is an accumulation of ideas that, have, that even though people can't quote the ideas, they don't know where they came from, they are now living in the mood that it is generated, of pessimism and of meaninglessness and of a willingness to just sort of give up. And we can't do that. That is not what it means to be human. <clears throat> And particularly for me as a Christian and as a minister in the Christian church, is not what it means for me to be a Christian. So we have to find our meta narrative, whatever that is. So I think we have somewhere to go for this, and we do have some hope in the fact that there is a return to authenticism. In fact, somebody, one philosopher has proposed that given the recent changes in just the last four or five years in the West, that we maybe should say that the age of postmodernism is coming to an end and the age of authenticism. Wouldn't that be good? Questions? Comments? Yes? Okay, uh, I think there are actually maybe uh, two more. Uh, your kid, okay. I call them all, and uh, I do want to thank you for uh, the entire series. Uh, I, I think uh, we have to kind of, uh, it's Western thought, I know you're talking about philosophy. I think we have to ask the question who are our priests and what are the worship? I think in my experience, looking back over the last 40 or 50 years, our priests are now the economists around the world, and they're teaching and preaching economic theory, growth, and profit as the only measures that we all say. Right. And they, and, uh, and they are encouraging us to worship consumerism. Um, uh, more is better. Uh, all, all of the things which good for me, I don't care about the environment or the rest of the world. So, so I, I, I would say, uh, is who are our priests think about us, and who are we following? And number 12, what is it we're worshiping as individuals in our life and values? Right. So, good. And I agree with both those things. In fact, Eric Hoffer, uh, he's an American secular philosopher, uh, not religious, wrote a book called The True Believer. And one of the most insightful things of Hoffer, and he's a, he's a brilliant, I believe, philosopher, one of the uh, things he said in that book was, Whatever you think about most is your God. And he said that from a not religious point of view. And the idea that you know, the economists have become our new priests and we worship at the altar of the stock market, if you spend more time thinking about how your, how your investments are doing than you do about the divine, again, I'm not about God, about whatever you think is the transcendent reality, then you need to ask yourself, what am I really worshiping? What is my God? I think that's what you're saying. What are we worshiping? Yes, Carla. Could it be that lately these nations want to go back to their own nation and be separated from the bigger part of a country? Or right. Is that part of maybe wanting to be more authentic? Have they been drowned out, sort of, in many Yeah, she's saying that the move to countries to be more independent and you know, back to being more solitary is that part of the authentic movement. I actually think that's part of postmodernism. Because one of the things about postmodernism was 
modernism and then postmodernism is since there is no universal truth, there is no objective reality, then you can't call different people from different environments to join together in one, in, uh, under one ideology, if you will. Um, and I think we're seeing it, and in fact, it pushes people toward individualism, either me as a person or, or my tribe. People have said that the postmodern movement is toward a tribal um, society where only the people that are agree with my ideology, that agree with my tribal kind of uh, values. I can't expect that anybody else is going to relate to those because their values are completely different and values are independent. Okay? There is no overriding, overriding values. has pushed people more toward a tribal kind of mentality, either me or me and my family or me and my tribe. And I see the, the result in that, I believe, is that we're moving away from, see that the League of Nations first, and then the UN, the EU, all of the, those kinds of moves were really a modernist kind of idea that we can do better, we can prevent war between each other, we can open our borders, we can have open economic relationships, one currency. That's a very modernist idea that we can progress as a society. Well, postmodernism says it hasn't worked. It's not going to work. And so what are we seeing? We're seeing the decay of the EU. We're seeing questioning about the UN. We're seeing a, a people, people and, and countries. Countries are just people. And the decisions that countries make are made by some entity or country. They're made by the people in charge of pulling back and saying, you know, Britain for the British, France for the French, you know, etc. And we see that manifested, and that actually is one of the symptoms that postmodernism would have predicted based upon this, my values, not yours, I don't agree with yours, uh, you don't understand mine, therefore we're going to go off our own way. Okay? I, th I think more authentic would be for people to be willing to work together. I mean, that's the thing we, want. we hope we're going to work together. Yes, go ahead. In the United States, that worked because they were all separate states and had their own Right. And that has worked. Right. Yeah. And yet there has been a move recently to to question that. I mean, you know, the Republic of Texas. You know, there's groups of people who believe they want to be separate because they don't like having somebody else's values imposed on them. Right? Don't you hear that all the time? The, the people in Washington are imposing their values on me. The Supreme Court is imposing their values on me. The idea that we can share together and come up with values we all agree on is a foreign concept now. That's part of what's wrong. There is no universal, there, there is no higher uh, level of value that we can all feel to and agree to. And you see, I mean, in, in the current presidential campaign in the United States, the kind of divisiveness that is being pushed and the fact that so many people are buying into that of, you know, it's me and mine. Get rid of everybody that's not that. That's very much toward the, you know, my values will not accept or allow for their values. Yes. Uh, there was an article in the whole blog uh, about a Jewish coin that on one side it had uh, one thing and on the other side it had a Nazi. Did you see that article? Mm -hmm. It was in the this last month's mm -hmm. article. And basically the conclusion was that, that no Nazism is not going to work, and, it, and what I got from it was that Zionism by itself was a bad thing also. That somewhere or another all of a sudden we worked together. Hmm. Yeah, well, we had to live with each other. Yeah, it'd be interesting to ask Nazi and the Jew how they felt about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, because obviously they saw so I, I did read the article, I'd be interested in seeing it. I, I wasn't aware of anything like that. Um, but I think that you see the things like the rise of Nazism and the annihilation of 6 million Jews, perhaps as many as 12 million people overall, because it wasn't just Jews. It was Jehovah's Witnesses, it was gypsies, it was homosexuals, it was a lot of other kind of people that, that were executed in, in the camps. Um, that is the kind of thing that brought an end to the belief of modernism that we were getting better. Because it confronted us with the reality that we're not getting better. If anything, we're getting more efficient and being worse. 
And that's led us to a lot of the hopelessness now. But yeah, I'd be interested in seeing that in some sense. Other questions or comments? Yes? Like you said about the humility, I, I was taken back. I'm from Houston, the Republic of Texas, you know. And, <laughs> um, and a big company there was Enron. And I used to call on Enron, and there was no humility at Enron. It was all, if, if you don't understand our business model, then you're just not right. Yeah, there's not right. right. There was this incredible arrogance. And to the point that they believed their own stories that were based on nothing. It was ephemeral. It was, it was people concocting what they wanted reality to be or, or the stock to be, and it was completely baseless. I mean, there are certain truths. You have to produce something of value that people will buy with a currency to support your company. And, and of course, it all fell apart um, right. at one point. And that was a company truly, I think, when you we were going through this, it was based on my truth was important, and you're just too stupid to understand it. Right. Yeah, a book about the Enron um, growth and collapse is called The Smartest Guys in the Room. Because they really thought that they were the smartest guys and they were doing it and anybody who couldn't get it just wasn't smart enough. Um, and yet they are a perfect example of the fact that people who create their own truth, it really does become for them truth. I mean, they really do believe it's true, even when it's not. You know, we have an extraordinary ability to convince ourselves of what we want to believe. And so we make stuff up and we sell it to ourselves. <laughs> and yet that's, that's the way human beings are doing, especially in modern culture. And, and in older times, our parents took more role in teaching us to be more sensible than that, to be more honest than that, to be more realistic than that, to understand that you have to make something. And it either has value or it doesn't have value. You need to evaluate it based on that. It wasn't just all ephemeral. It wasn't all just air. And we've lost a lot of that. And that's well, there's that saying of frequently wrong but never in doubt. Yeah, frequently wrong but never in doubt. Yeah. Did you it's, develop those standpoints? Yes, I did. Based upon my own thoughts about it. So, anything else? Thank you all very much.